All right, I'd like to thank you all for coming to this month's TREAD Talk. Doug Malone, the Curator and Director of Vehicle Operations, is here to tell you about one of our shining stars, the 1930 Cadillac V16 Roadster. <coughs> Not only is it a fascinating car, it's a car with a great history, the kind of thing we really look for and love to have here that tells a story all its own, whether you're a gearhead or not. Um, Doug's been doing this a long time for us, and I also want to remind everybody that we need to say happy anniversary because tomorrow is Doug and Lane's anniversary. Oh. So, happy Thank anniversary. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it is a great delight to be here to tell you about the Cadillac V16 today. When I had to dress in period clothing, it's not appropriate to talk about such a grand car in blue jeans or shorts, you know, it just wasn't going to work. But uh, uh, I am going to do the gentlemanly thing, because as you all know, back in the period, gentlemen all wore hats, but whenever they came into a building, they removed their hats. And because it's awful warm, I'm going to take it off and respect that. So, um, anyway, um, we acquired this car in April of 2022. And uh, in, in Auburn, Indiana, uh, our vehicle team of Chris Gergeny, Nick Pell, our mechanic, and myself flew out there to specifically look at this car that was coming up for auction. The museum had always wanted a V16 for the collection, and this one came up. And, and uh, fortunately, the auction was a success for us. We were able to bring it back to our museum, and uh, it's had a rich history. It's won a lot of awards, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But um, we also brought back that really cool little 1967 Sunbeam Tiger II at that same auction. So it was an expensive auction, needless to say. But uh, anyway, uh, a little bit about this car. I think before we really talk about the V16 itself, I think it's very important to talk about the history of Cadillac. Because that's such an important part of how we came to something as grand as this Cadillac V16. And a lot of people don't realize... But um, Henry Ford had a part in Cadillac. Henry Ford, as you all know, had Ford Motor Car Company, which is still in business today, very successful company. But before he had a successful company, he had two failed business car opportunities. His first one was the Detroit Automobile Company, which was started in 1899. He had 12 investors, including the mayor of Detroit. And um, after a short time of Henry, was never quite satisfied. Henry was the guy that was building the cars, and he was never quite satisfied with them going out to be sold until they were just perfect. His investors were getting really upset with them because they wanted to turn money. They, they had put money into the company to make money, not to watch Henry Ford constantly be peddling on a car instead of getting it out there and getting it sold. So after just a short time of a little under two years, uh, the Detroit Automobile Company folded. A lot of the investors uh, that were part of that then joined Henry Ford when Henry went out to start his other own company, the Henry Ford Company, and that uh, started in 1901. He had two investors at that time, William Murphy, who had been also with the Detroit Automobile Club, our company, and Lemuel Bowen. Uh, these two guys were the money behind it. Uh, here again, Henry Ford was the mechanic and the, the design guy. And they got frustrated with Henry, too, because Henry was into racing. He liked racing cars. He built a racing car, and uh, he was always piddling on that car and just not building cars for the company. And so after just almost, not even quite a year, just about a year, uh, these two guys decided they'd seen Oldsmobile. Eli Ransom Olds had come out with the Olds Curve Dash about uh, a few years before that, and they'd seen how successful that car had been, and they were turning a profit. And these guys wanted to be doing the same thing, and Henry Ford was just kind of dragging his feet on producing cars. And so after just a short time, the company was going to fold. They called a gentleman by the name of Henry Leland. Now, Henry Leland had a rich history in machinery, precision machinery. He'd gotten a start as a young man working for Colt, um, Colt Revolvers Gun Company. You know, that re required a lot of precision work. He then went to work for a company called Brown & Sharp, who made precision machinery and equipment, uh, including sewing machines and all kinds of different things. Uh, they built uh, equipment with a lot of precision. So, so Henry was really getting a background in how to make things really precision fit, including he started his own company, I believe it was around 1890, called Leland and Falconer Manufacturing. Leland was the uh, machinist and engineer. Falconer was the financial guy. And it was a very successful company. In fact, they started building gears for Eli Ransom old cars transmissions and had a contract to build 2,000 engines for Oldsmobile at that time. Uh, about 1901, Oldsmobile factory caught on fire and burned to the ground. They were able to save one car out of it. 
And uh, about that same time, Henry Leland had a gentleman come to work for him by the name of uh, uh, Brush. I'll find his name here in a minute. Uh, last name was Brush, and he was a very good mechanic, and he even was able to tweak the engine that Henry Leland had designed and built for the, for the Oldsmobile. But because Oldsmobile just had that fire, they didn't want to retool for a new engine. And so they canceled the order for the 2000 engines and um, opened their factory back up, started producing cars again. But Henry Leland was called into Ford, Henry Ford Company, to appraise the company for liquidation. And uh, when Henry Leland did that and he saw the equipment, he saw some of the body styles that Ford had designed and was building, he said, you know, guys, I wouldn't liquidate this company. I'd just restructure it and form something else. And so Henry Ford was bought out for $900 in the use of his name. And, and uh, Mr. Um, these two guys here, William Murphy, Lemuel Bowen, and Leland Murphy, or Leland, Henry Leland went into business together to form what would become Cadillac in 1902. And so if it hadn't been for Henry Ford, Cadillac Motors would have never existed. Now, where does the name Cadillac come from? That's an interesting story. But as gentlemen, I'll let you figure out how to pronounce it. I'm not French, but I'm going to really probably slaughter it. But I'm going to say it's Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac. Anyway, he was an early French explorer. Uh, he was exploring around up by the Great Lakes area of the United States and uh, founded an area uh, which is now called Detroit, uh, where they built uh, Fort Pontchartrain, Detroit, uh, Fort Detroit. And so he's very much classified as the founder of Detroit. And so since that was such going to be such an auto hub or was starting to become such an auto hub, when they decided to start Cadillac, they decided they'd name the car after, after uh, Mr. Cadillac. And one of the first cars uh, came out in 1903, but this is a 1904 Cadillac runabout. looked very similar to this, just a single cylinder car, uh, known as horseless carriages back then, about 10 horsepowers. And you can see the style on it, very French, with that little front end on it. Uh, these were very much so the cars that Henry Ford had designed for what was going to be the Henry Ford Company. And so since they had some of these body styles, they just tweaked them a little bit and uh, dropped uh, the engine in it that Henry Leland had built for Oldsmobile, and uh, the car took off. Now, a lot of cars back then, when you repaired cars, you know, we think about cars and the precision of cars today, but back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, that wasn't the case. They were, they were built by machinists but didn't have a lot of skill. Um, but Henry Leland having that precision training early on in his life, Cadillacs were very well built. And that's what they got known as their reputation, as we're going to find out here in a minute. But anyway, they used some of the early bodies that was going to be designed for the Henry Ford Company. Of course, Henry Ford started his own company, the Ford Motor Car Company, in 1903. We all know that all then took off eventually was a success for him. But um, Cadillac is now not the oldest U.S. car automotive still in business. That's still Buick. Buick has been around about three years longer than Cadillac. But uh, outside of that, all the other companies were started afterwards or have since folded. So Cadillac's been around for now 120 two years, I guess, so uh, still building remarkable cars. About 1904, they came out with a four-cylinder engine. This is a 1905 Cadillac Model D. Um, a lot of cars at that time were either single-cylinder or four-cylinder cars. Started to get into some six-cylinder cars later in the 1900s, 1905, or 1908, 1909. Our Peerless out here is a six-cylinder vehicle. But most of the cars back then were four-cylinders. Um, and the name I was looking for earlier was Allison, Allison Partridge Brush. Uh, he was an engineer that had worked for Le Henry Leland and helped build the engine for the Cadillac and really knew how to tweak it. He later went on to start his own car company, the Brush Car Company. Maybe you've heard of it. It later folded, but uh, was successful for a while. But this is a nice example of a 1905 Cadillac. About $2,800 back then, very expensive, about $91,000 in today's dollars. But uh, they were beautiful cars. Now another gentleman that comes into play very much is William Crapo Durant, and uh, he formed what we know today as General Motors. He formed that in 1908, and he started that with Buick and Oldsmobile. Uh, he got them to join together, and by 1909, Cadillac was, Cadillac was becoming more successful, so Durant asked them to join General Motors, and so they did, and, uh, uh, but Leland was allowed to stay on as the, the CEO of Cadillac, uh, which he did until 1917. 1917, we were at the throes of World War I, and the government had asked Cadillac to produce uh, Liberty engines for airplanes. 
and Durant was a pacifist, he didn't want to do that, and so that upset Henry Leland, so Henry Leland left Cadillac uh, to start a new car company, which is called Lincoln. And he was very successful for Lincoln Motor Cars. They built airplane engines at first for the war. They started building cars, luxury automobiles. But unfortunately, by 1922, the car company was insolvent. And as a story twist goes on that story, who bought the car, Lincoln Car Company, was Henry Ford. He bought out Henry Leland, who would put him out of business with the Cadillac at first. And so Henry Ford bought out uh, Lincoln for $8 million. It was an auction. He bid up to $5 million, was a high auction. The judge would not let it sell for that, said you have to pay at least $8 million. The company was valued at over $16 million. So Henry Ford did pay $8 million for Lincoln and turned it into part of Ford Motor Car Company. And uh, then uh, Henry Leland stepped away from car production. But anyway, some fascinating, it's just fascinating when you look back in car history, how many of these players, you got here, you got Eli Olds, you've got Brush, you've got uh, Durant, all these big wigs in automotive history all knew each other in those days. And some of them worked together very well, some of them didn't work together very well. A lot of companies dissolved over disputes. So it was, it was a cutthroat business, and still is today, but even so, more so back when car companies were being formed. But uh, uh, William Crapo Durant played a big part in forming Gen General Motors. Unfortunately, um, twist of fate, uh, he ended up dying broke in the 1930s, I believe it was, uh, died broke. Uh, made some poor investments, over, kind of overextended himself, uh, made some bad financial decisions, but uh, uh, General Motors didn't go broke, just William Durant did. Another person that plays an important part in Cadillac is Charles Kettering. Now back before 1912, you had to pretty much hand crank all cars to get them started. If you ever cranked, started a car, you know what a challenge that is. It's, it's a risky business. It inquire, requires some strength and some timing of different parts on the car and it's very easy to break a wrist or a, break a thumb off if the car backfires if you don't have the timing set right and um, has, ha, how it happened to be that about the electric starter was uh, Henry Leland had a good friend by the name of Byron Carter later had Carter cars and Mr. Carter was driving across a bridge and there was a Cadillac broken down alongside the road. Mr. Carter got out of his car to help the lady start her Cadillac and cranked the car, the crank backfired, hit him in the cheek broke his jaw and his arm, and uh, he was hospitalized, got pneumonia and passed away two months later. Henry Leland lost a good friend because of a Cadillac backfiring and breaking his friend's cheek. He says, I don't want anybody to die starting one of my cars. So he worked with Charles Kettering, who was with uh, Delco, as we know today, as Dayton, Dayton Engineering Laboratories, to develop a self-starting vehicle, which he did in 1912. That was also the same year that they developed lights, electrical lights for the car. So Cadillac in 1912 had electrical lights and electrical starter to, uh, to get the car going. A very stepping stone for automotive history because electric cars at that time, yes there were early electric cars that were actually performing better than the engineer or the gasoline powered ones because they were easy to start. Get in, push a button, off you go. Ladies really liked that. Well, they didn't go very fast so they weren't popular that way. So when they got the self-starter for the cars, the ladies no longer had to crank them the gasoline power car started taking off, electrical cars disappeared until this, what, this turn of this century uh, where we started seeing them come back. But uh, Charles Kettering was a very important man for Cadillac. Um, the DeWar Trophy is very important. Uh, that's put out by the uh, England's Royal Automobile Club. It's a high honor. In 1908, Cadillac shipped three Cadillacs over to the United Kingdom to compete in a race. And after the race, uh, as part of this competition, they disassembled all three cars, which was over 2,000 parts, threw them in a bin, took out 189 of those parts, duplicated them with reproduction parts from the factory, took those in the mix, stirred it up, and had the guys reassemble the three cars, got them back together, started them, and they drove them for 500 more miles. Because of that interchangeability of parts, the precision, they got the DeWar Trophy for uh, being able to mass produce precision cars that you could put other parts on and it would work without having to take them to a blacksmith to have something done. And so they won the DeWar Trophy in 1908 and they therefore became the standard of the world. That's where they got their name in 1908. They won a second one in 1912 electric starter and so Cadillac is the only U.S. company to ever have won two DeWar Trophies, which is quite an honor. <coughs> By 1915, they came out with the V8 engine, and it was a, uh, 
uh, L head, flat head uh, V8, but uh, it was the first mass produced V8 in a car. There were some other en eight cylinder engines that were out by that time, but Cadillac was the first one to put it in production assembly line and uh, uh, produce n numerous of them. You see over 13,000 in the first year, and so they were making strides. You know, we think about Cadillac being a luxury car, and it was back in the time, but there were other car companies that aren't luxury, but they're prestigious. And the one that they were really competing with was Packard. Packard, and we've got a couple of Packards out here, and you can see how grand those cars were. But that was uh, uh, something that Cadillac could never compete with. Packard always was one step ahead of them with engines of the twin six, uh, beautiful sculptured cars. Uh, people would see them on the road, and just the presence of the Packard just sent a statement. And so Cadillac wasn't to that, to that part yet. So you can see the beautiful Duesenberg and Packard Custom Age. This is the grand cars that we were starting to see in the 1920s. Fisher Brothers' body also plays an important part in the Cadillac history. Uh, a lot of cars, especially General Motors cars, a lot, especially through the 90s and 2000s, you look in the seal plate, it'll say body by Fisher or body by Fleetwood or something like that. That was all from where these gentlemen started. They were a carriage company, built bodies by the early 1900s, started building car bodies for for Ford and Studebaker and Cadillac and Olds and all different kinds of companies. By 1914, they're world's largest body producer for cars. Well, General Motors um, bought out 60% uh, of their company in 1919, so it became a part of General Motors. And Lawrence Fisher, who I believe is this gentleman, these are the seven Fisher brothers. Uh, I believe this is Lawrence Fisher here. He went to work for Cadillac as their new president in 1925, and Lawrence Fisher was the one that really had the vision for where Cadillac needed to go. He had Packard in his eye, and he says, we're gonna get Cadillac up to that standard and, and surpass it. So almost immediately, uh, he bought the rest of Fisher body, so it was all 100% General Motors. Um, he purchased Fleetwood body, which was another massive uh, company, body shop, or body building company in 1925 and he hired Harley Earl. Now we all know where Harley Earl went with Cadillac and General Motors being their head designer, um, famous for the famous tail fins on Cadillacs in the 40s and 50s and so many great styles. But he hired Henry or uh, Harley Earl in 1925 because he wanted to have a lower priced car for just to boost up the financial power of the Cadillac car company. So they came out with the LaSalle in 1927, known as a baby Cadillac. Um, Harley Earl designed that car, it was very successful, and it was a low price car to the regular Cadillac. And that allowed them to be able to focus on their new flagship, which was going to be the V16. Uh, so in 1926, um, Lawrence Fisher hired Owen Knacker away from Marmon Car Company. Marmon Car Company was another prestigious company coming up in the ranks, and they were working on a V16 engine that they were kind of keeping quiet. Well, I don't know how, but somehow Lawrence Fisher got word of that. So went to Marmon, who was in a little bit of financial problems in 1926, and hired Owen Knacker, their head engineer, who was designing that engine away from Marmon to come to work for Cadillac. Um, this is a little bit about Knacker. That's a picture of him. Um, I'll just read this. In 1926, Fisher hired Owen Knacker, previously a senior engineer at the Indianapolis-based Marmon Motor Car Company, as a new head of the engine department. At Marmon, Knackard and Howard Marmon had discussed the possibility of the ultimate multi-cylinder engine, a V16. The engine apparently was only in the conceptual stages when Knacker left Marmon, but it was exactly what Fisher had in mind. Various automakers, including Daimler, Hispano Suiza, and Delage had V12 engines, but no one, even Bugatti, had a 16-cylinder car. To ensure that its impact would not be diluted, the Cadillac V16 was developed with a level of secrecy more befitting a new military aircraft than a car. As a cover, the engine was described as a V12, not a V16. Even within the Cadillac ranks themselves, all paperwork described it as a coach or bus engine. In truth, Knacker was also working on a V12 as a follow-up to the 16-cylinder car, sharing many of the same parts and tooling, but few outside of Knacker's engineering team had any idea what they were actually creating. And so Cadillac kept it very hushed. They didn't want word to get out of what they were developing for their new car in 1930. And that brings us to where we are today uh, with this 30 Cadillac Roaster that we're going to talk about that we have in our collection. Not very many of these were built. They were very expensive cars, about fewer than 4,000 built over the seven year run of this model, the 452. Um, they did come out with a couple other V16 models a little bit later we'll talk about, but uh, this grand one that we're seeing here, they just made for seven production years. 
Now this car too, and it wouldn't, before we go on to talk about it, this car belonged to Atwater Kent. He was a gentleman that bought it brand new, uh, which says a lot about the prestige of this car. Atwater Kent at one time was the wealthiest man in the United States. Uh, he got his start uh, making a lot of patents. He uh, got a patent on the ignition coil uh, for cars, but he also, his big thing was radios. He developed a radio and uh, uh, was quite successful, especially in the 1920s, producing radios. This is a 1930, same year as this Cadillac, a uh, low boy radio, but he sold millions of these all around the world, even as his own radio station. So extremely wealthy gentleman. And so at around 1930, he bought this car brand new and ordered it uh, for his personal use. Now when this car was built, this one right here, it was an Imperial limousine. It wasn't the two-door Roadster. Sometime in the 1960s it was repurposed and had a roaster body put onto it. And we think about that today and we think, well, that's going to really hurt the value of it. But it doesn't because the simple rule that all these cars were pretty much custom built with custom bodies. And so you could have had any body on a chassis. And this was a correct body chassis for the V16. And when it was restored to a roaster from the limousine in the 1960s, it was done with the correct roaster body. And everything from the cowl, the windshield back, was off another body roadster, but everything from the forward front was the original Imperial uh, limousine uh, chassis. And so it's won so many numerous awards. Uh, and Cadillac LaSalle has won Best to Show, uh, Senior Honors, AACA, all these American Car Conqueror shows. It's won first place. So it's got over 70 awards that it's won since that time. So believe me, being in the car world, if a car is not factory correct, it doesn't win any of that stuff. So it's been accepted as being correct. Does it affect the value? Yeah, it does a little bit. If it was been born a roadster, it'd be a little bit more valuable than it was being, after being repurposed, but not a great deal. This, as it sits, is about a million dollar car. If it had been born a roadster, it'd probably be about a one and a half to two million car. So they're very expensive, very rare, hard to find cars today. Bodies for, I should stop and pause a little bit. And I've got up here, if you want to come up and look after my presentation, there are some pictures up here of all the bodies. I'm not going to go through each one of them because Fisher Body Company built as an option 10 bodies plus some extra pictures of some others that they could build. Fleetwood Body, which this is a Fleetwood Body, had over 70 different body styles plus they would also customize something. So we had over 80 plus standard body <laughs> styles that you could pick for this car and it also let the owners pick and match. So if you want something off this one to this one. So a lot of these are pretty one-off cars even though they had a body company like Fisher or Fleetwood build the bodies. Uh, there's so many different styles out there of them, all with a the general theme, but little tiny things like maybe the seal on one straight, uh, maybe one has a little bit of a curved seal on it, maybe one has a split window V-shape. I uh, know the Madam X uh, Fleetwoods uh, V16s are very special, but maybe about 12 of those. They have some special little body attributes to them. So um, uh, the Cadillac experts out there really know these cars inside and out and they can look at one and tell you what body it came from and what was tweaked on it. I don't have that expertise, but there is a, like I said, come up here afterwards and look at the, the uh, brochure up here and look at all the different unique body styles. But anyway, this one did start off as a limousine. Okay, the V16 engine specifications. It was produced from 1929 to 37. The 1929 is when it was produced, but it was for a 1930 model. Uh, the bore and stroke was three inches by four inches. And that's important because that was something that Cadillac, when they were devising the engine in the V16, one of the reasons they wanted the V16 is not to make the car go faster. Cadillac didn't really care about speed. They wanted it to be luxurious. They wanted it to be smooth. They wanted it to be quiet. The more cylinders you had to the car, the smaller the bore you could make the engine. So by having 12 instead of, or 8, 16 instead of 12 or 8, they could do the bore diameter smaller and the stroke smaller, which made the car quieter didn't have as much rattles and as much noise. It was easier on the engine. Uh, kept, it was easier to keep them cool. Uh, they did drink gasoline though. They did drink a lot of gasoline. This car, depending on the body style, anywhere from four to eight miles per gallon. And again, this car holds 25 gallons. So you're going anywhere from 100 miles to 125 miles before you need to fill that car up. So that's uh, like from here to Kansas City, you have to fill it up if you make it. So uh, it, drank, it drank gas, but at 15 cents a gallon, and if you could afford this car, you didn't really care back then. But we look at that day and go, oh my gosh, that's, that's insane. But uh, it was a thirsty car. Um, 45 degree V, and that was the ideal angle for, for a 12 cylinder, or a 16 cylinder, I mean. 
Uh, compression ratio of 5.35 to 1. The fuels back then didn't allow you to do too much more than that without having issues. Uh, it's an overhead valve, uh, two valves per cylinder. Uh, power output was between 165 and 185 miles per hour, or horsepower, I should say, not per hour. The speed of the car, the roasters were graded at about 100 miles per hour. Uh, the bigger limousine stuff were about 85, so varied about 15 miles an hour depending on the weight of the car. Uh, this car here is about 6,500 pounds, which is extremely heavy in today's standards. Um, anyway, it was used from 1939 to 37. When we get done with the presentation, we're going to open the hood up. We're going to start it up so you can hear it. But it's actually, it's a work of art underneath this car, as you're going to see here in a minute. Um, this is a picture of one being assembled. I believe one of those photos is Mr. Knacker. I'm not sure, but it's what I believe the credit said. But uh, these guys assembling a, a V16, you can see all the intricacies of it. One of the things that was very important to Cadillac, they wanted the engine to be just as gorgeous underneath the hood as, uh, as the car was on the exterior. So when you look at the car engine, it's, it, it looks, the pictures don't do it justice. You're going to see when you come to see it. But everything was done in black porcelain or black enamel paint with chrome trim. You didn't want any wires exposed, you didn't want any hoses exposed. So, you know, today we open our car hoods and it's a piece of plastic over the top of it. Kind of the same principle, I guess, but that wasn't the case with these. You could see the engine, but it was everything that was ugly was hidden. And um, you have uh, uh, the water pump was on the passenger side. It sits down over here. That's a closer view of it here. You have, it has two carburetors. There's one on each side. This is one on the passenger side. There's also two fuel pumps, one on each side. These were vacuum operated to get the fuel up to the pump and then it would gravity flow down to the carburetor. This car has since been retrofitted with uh, electric fuel pumps to help it. Uh, the vacuum uh, fuel pumps were very unreliable and tended to, to fail. Um, this is the driver's side. Here again you can see the, the carburetor on this side and the fuel pump sitting up over here. See the driving shaft coming down to the steering gear. Um, here again, the beautiful chrome covers, the chrome cover over the fuel pumps. Just everything was just finished out to make it just as exemplary underneath the hood as it was outside. Two ignition coils, they're up right behind the radiator. And you can see them both sitting here. And when we open the hood, you'll be able to see them. But even those wires, I tried to hide. They had a little metal decorative piece to cover the wires. Here you can see the intricacy of the wires coming out of the distributor, how they're all covered immediately going underneath the cover uh, to the spark plugs without being seen. Uh, just a very clean, neat, uh, beautiful presentation. The dashboard on the car is very impressive. Um, Raya gauges uh, on the far left. You have your gas gauge, 0 to 25 gallons. You can just watch that go down as you drive around the block. <laughs> you have your oil pressure. Uh, this is a, this is a standard clock. Uh, then your, your miles per hour, your odometer here. Um, this is uh, water temperature. And over here is amps, battery charge. These two things right here are dash lamps. And the buttons here activate those little lamps that will come on. Um, i got to remember what this is. Chris, you remember what that is? No. I'll think of it here in a minute. And then, of course, your key, your spark, and your choke. Uh, the key is kind of interesting. It's got kind of an early self-lock. You know, the cars today, you, you turn it, lock it, and pull the key out. You can't turn it. That's kind of the way this was. It's, when you push it in, it's locked. You can't start the car with any other key. To start the car, you have to put the key and turn it. That little switch pops out, and you can turn the key the rest of the way. Then there's a starter pedal on the floor to start it. But um, uh, just a beautiful array of gauges. Some of the limousines and some of the V16s had radios. That was something very new at the time. This one does not have a radio. Radios back at that time were very cumbersome, and the antennas that they had to put on them were god-awful ugly. So the Cadillac didn't have them on a lot of their cars because they were ugly looking. This shows the pedal arrangement, very custom to today. You have your, your clutch pedal, your brake, your accelerator pedal. This little button up here, pedal, is your starter button. So once you turn the key on, you push that pedal to start the car. On the steering hub is uh, some switches, a throttle control up here. It's kind of like a cruise control. You can close it or open it up, and when you pull that, the gas pedal will go down. You'll see the gas pedal go down. So it's just an early way, if you want to idle at a different type of a speed, you can adjust that. Uh, or if you're driving just cruising, you can kind of just set that and you don't have to have your foot on the pedal. Uh, the light switches down here, you have your parking lights, which are the little ones up on the fender. And then your headlights, your down, it says down and up, that's your low beam and high beam on your headlights. They even had that back in that time. Uh, handbrake over here, uh, right beside the gear shift lever. Lots of room inside the car, very, very well appointed. 
over 80 different interiors you get in the V16, so a lot of choices there. Lots of accessories that you could order. Not all cars came fully loaded. Just like today's cars, you could order special accessories, and Cadillac was no different. This car has a very special accessory, and that's the trunk on the back. Not all Cadillacs came with even a trunk. Uh, very important because there wasn't really any trunk space in these cars, especially if it had a rumble seat, which this car does. But this accessory in ours, and we'll go open it up here for you when we get done. But the neat thing about it is it's a Cadillac official accessory trunk, which is very rare. It even has a emblem on there that says so. But there are three pieces of fitted luggage. You can see them inside that trunk. So you could take the luggage inside your house, pack your suitcases, bring it back. You know it's going to fit in the trunk just like a piece of a puzzle. And it'll then close very well lined. Uh, very expensive accessory. Uh, to have the rack for the trunk was $180. To buy the suitcases was $100. So it doesn't sound like much, but in today's dollars, that's $4,300. So that's a lot of money. <coughs> Just to be able to park, pack your clothes. Mascot options. And I, I did say mascot, Chris. And Chris and I got an education last November. We went to a, a car museum uh, convention down in Naples, Florida. And one of the presentations was on car mascots. So we went to it. Well, we learned we had mistakenly been calling these hood ornaments. Uh-uh, that's the wrong thing. That's not a hood ornament. That's a mascot. If it sits on top of the radiator, which all the early cars did, because a lot of times it was where you turn it off to fill the radiator up, it's a mascot. The mascot also may sit on the dash, may sit up on the cowl, but those are mascots. When the engines eventually had the hoods completely over the radiators, it became one piece, and that became an ornament on top of the hood, then they were classified as hood ornaments. So this is a mascot. I'm, I'm still learning that. I still catch myself saying it wrong. But anyway, Cadillac introduced two mascots that year, uh, the flying uh, Cadillac goddess uh, and the heron. And you could choose either one or you didn't have to have any. You could just have a regular cap on there. The Gal goddess was the most popular that was selected. It was very expensive, uh, about $2,000 for the, just the, the mascot. Uh, or you could have the heron. Um, like I said, most people chose the Goddess. I have seen some V16 with these. Um, these they quit making these after three years, so they're rarer today, so they're probably more valuable uh, than the, the Flying Goddess. But these are really gorgeous and beautiful, and that was both introduced in 1930 as options on the Cadillac. Of course, the grill badge in the middle of the grill, specifies in a bold V16. Let everybody know that you've got a V16 underneath the hood. Uh, optional wire wheels. Standard was the artillery wood wheels on the cars. Uh, you could also get just a standard wood wheel or you could get a steel wheel, disc wheel, but most popular was the optional wire wheels. These are about $3,000 if you wanted to put those onto your car. Even the little mirrors and stuff on the car. If you look up here, when you walk up here afterwards, uh, the tires, the spare tires on each side, dual mounts on the car. Cadillac beautifully encased in a piece of steel. Here again in this car, polished out beautiful black finish. And strapped to each of those, or in this car, I guess they're actually mounted, they're not strapped, are two rear view mirrors. And just the intricate etching of the stainless steel, or the mirrors, even the little Cadillac crest on there. Uh, these mirrors were about $500. Um, the, the tires covers were another $1,000. So you start adding this all up. Here again, it goes adding up and what the value of the car is. But uh, just the craftsmanship in these cars is just remarkable. Now, 1937, they did a body change and started coming to fit more what the period of cars were looking like. And we got to something like you see here in this 1930 Cadillac V16 Series 90 car. They built these from 1938 to 1940. I just got back from a Cadillac convention in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where there was one of these sitting there. And while it was a grand, beautiful car, it just does not have the same grandeur as what these earlier cars did. And that's so much true. Even Packard did the same thing. We had a 1941 Packard here for a while. It was a 40 or 41, I can't remember, 41. The black one out here, beautiful car, but when you had it next to the 31, 32 Packard, it just was not the same car. But times were changing, body styles were changing. Uh, still a very powerful, beautiful car. Engines weren't as detailed as they were in the V16 of the earlier years. He had exposed wires. Uh, it was a 135 degree V, so it's almost a flat engine, which laid for a much lower car. You had dual carburetors with dual air cleaners, um, but you didn't have all the beautiful chrome, didn't have the black enamel paints. Uh, very functional, very powerful engine at 185 horsepower, but just didn't have the beauty and the grandeur of the earlier V16s. 
So what was the Cadillac V16 production? It started off in 1930, they sold a bunch, almost 3,000 that first year. And that's surprising because this car came out in January 4th of 1930. What happened two months before that? Stock market crashed. Horrible time to bring out something like this, you know. But people that had money, if they were able to keep it, still had money. So the people were hot and people thought this isn't going to last long, you know, there was anything about the depression. So they were still spending money. So they sold over almost 3,000 of them. 1931, the reality of what had happened with the stock market crash was sinking in. And so we saw lower numbers down to 364. Um, 1932, here again we had another drop. Then after that they made fewer than 50 a year through the end of 1937. So the first year was the most prosperous for the V16. Uh, with by 1937 dropping off, then from 1938 to 40, through all both those years, a total of 500 uh, for, for those two years. Price and volume uh, really was insufficient to turn out a profit on these cars, even from the very beginning. But prestige and the cost uh, seems to have been Cadillac's true motive. They they really wanted to get their car out there and make a statement, which was successful. They did. Cadillac became the premier car, luxury car to own in the United States uh, from that point on. Uh, Packard later went out of business, Marmon went out of business, Piercero, Duesenberg, Cadillac survived and, and through the 1960s, early 70s, Cadillac was the mark. If you said you owned a Cadillac, you were, you were living life right. Unfortunately, the 80s, uh, Cadillac lost some of their class. They, well, a lot of cars <laughs> lost some of their class in the 80s, but uh, Cadillac really did. Downsizing, poor craftsmanship, a lot of foreign makes coming in that were eating their lunch. And so Cadillac's been struggling ever since to regain their their uh, prestige, I think they're getting there, but they've got a ways to go. I don't know if they'll ever catch up to where it was in the 1920s, 1930s, especially the 1930s with the V16. Now something else, we, we talk about the stock market affecting the, the sales of the V16, and while that was probably true to some point, which we saw in numbers, the thing that really hurt the V16 was the V12. And they introduced this in 1930 also, about six months after they introduced the, 19, the V16. They came out with the V12. And this was here again, uh, an, an Owen Knacker produced engine. The car is almost identical to a V16. You open up the hood, it's got the same black enamel, the same chrome. So the V12, V16, it's got the V12 on the front. A Little bit smaller hood, a little bit smaller car, uh, but very almost identical. I'd almost call it a baby V16. And people were buying this. They could afford this. This was, you know, $4,500 to $5,000 instead of seven dollars to $9,000. And so it was almost half the price of the V16 and looked just as grand in a lot of aspects. So they sold over 10,000, almost 11,000 of these in the same time that we sold a little under 4,000 of the, the other models. So uh, this really hurt sales of the V16 probably more than anything. But it was still its Cadillac and it was still producing a profit for Cadillac, maybe even more so because of the lower production cost of this car, but both beautiful cars. Uh, I've seen a V12 in person and they're, they're just absolutely gorgeous. Um, so hopefully maybe someday we'll have a V12 in here as well. But um, uh, anyway, a little bit of the history of those cars. So Now, <coughs> did the V16 the end of it? Nope. Cadillac in 2003 decided they're going to introduce the V16. They came out with a concept car in 2003 that was a nod to those early 30s. The engine very, very much with the black the stripes, just like you see on the 1930 V16. They're just trying to mimic that whole personification. I think it would have been successful. It was planned to come out in 2008. What happened in 2008? Stock market, everything, boom, boom. Cadillac backburnered it, so it didn't happen. So it never, there's one of them, so there's one V16 Cadillac out there, uh, concept car, which you saw right there. A uh, lot different looking than what this one is, but. In 2000 or 2000s, that was pretty sporty looking. Um, no mascot or hood ornament on that one, I know. That's a missing. But um, anyway, that's the story of the V16. Um, I'm going to invite you up. We're going to start it up. I'm going to have Chris help me. We're going to open the door and we'll start it up. I'm not going to leave it running very long or we'll have everybody smoked out of here. But it's a very quiet car. Now, when you hear it turn over, you're going to think, man, the battery's about <laughs> dead. No, it's got a six volt battery system turning over a huge engine. So it goes, Rrr you think this isn't going to start and all of a sudden it'll fire off hopefully <laughs> it did this morning so that's completely normal for these cars thank goodness for 12 volt battery systems and later cars uh, we're going to open the hood after we start we'll start it first run it then I'll open the hood and Chris and I'll be around to show you features we'll open up the trunk let you look we'll open up where the battery is where the tool kit is this car came with its own tools 
which are still original to the car. Uh, it's just an amazing car. Ask questions about it. If you want to sit in it, well, at this rare time, we'll let you sit in it. We normally don't let people sit in this car, but if you want to get it, your picture taken in it, by all means, today's a chance to get that done. Um, and so we'll be around. So before we do that, though, any questions anybody has? It's <coughs> a little door on the side for golf clubs. That is, yep. Thank you, Howard. Yep, this is golf club storage. Let's open this up and you can slide your clubs in there. The Packards have that as well. You've probably seen that on the Packards out there, but you can tell who they were catering to. They got the country club set here. So yeah, they have a place for the golf clubs. This is where the battery is, and we'll open that up for you if you want to see it. It's a very long battery, which the six volts were back then. This is just a dummy plate. They wanted it to match, so this does nothing except be decorative. Another side where this is, is where the tools are. There's a toolbox in there that will pull out, but all the tools specifically for the car over there, right behind that's another dummy plate. So uh, they wanted it to be streamlined. Notice the little features like this. Open up the door. A little light comes on for the running board. You have spotlights, you have the massive headlights, driving lights, which turn when you turn the steering wheel, the driving lights turn with the road. You got your parking lights, you got your dual mirrors. Uh, just a grand car. The rumble seat back here, we'll open that up for you. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful car. The top will fold down, make it a completely open car. But when you're sitting behind that hood, if you get a chance to sit in it, just looking out over that massive hood with that beautiful mascot on the end, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous car. I'm looking forward to the day I get to drive it. I have not driven this car. We got it delivered to us a little over a year ago. Nick, our mechanic, went through it. We put it on the display floor to get it ready for a reveal and hasn't left the floor since. So one of these days, we're going to get it out. Right, Chris? We're going to get this out. Yeah. So, so, so that's why it smokes a little bit. It hasn't been started. You know, this car hadn't been started for a year. And Nick, a mechanic, I had Nick help me put it in here Thursday. Chris and I put it in here. It started up within just a few turns. It fired right up. So I said, I didn't expect that. Chris, Nick goes, I didn't either. <laughs> so. so. So that was pretty good, so, yeah. How many are in existence now? They think about half of them, about half of them. Um, but it's hard to tell. A lot of, you know, it's surprising, Mike, how many people have cars like this that don't talk about. They're just a private collection. They're in their garage or in their grandfather's garage, just sitting there, and you don't find out about them. And we find that out all the time here at the museum. We'll hear about cars that nobody knows people have. So there could be could be more, but I'm going to guess there's probably a couple thousand of them out there. But they're very valuable, especially some certain body styles. The Roadster was the least expensive. Uh, it was the most fun. It was very sporty looking, but it was the least expensive of the model styles. The, the limousines and stuff were a little, a little higher dollar. It's a little fewer of those made. Of course, the Madame X are the most expensive, valuable of the design styles. But um, just beautiful, beautiful cars. And it's, oh, I forgot to talk about the clacks and horns. It's got dual clacks and horns. I'll sound those for you. <laughs> Early automotive horns. Beats the old bulb, though. So, any other questions? All right, let's see if it'll fire up. Check it out, folks.